Welcome to NFT Sundays, a weekly conversation around art and technology, brought to you by Dementi and the Museum of Crypto Art. Welcome to the next installation of NFT Sundays. My name is Colborn Bell of the Museum of Crypto Art. Uh, very grateful to the Dementi team for helping us to produce these artist interviews. Uh, we are here with the incredible artist, Sam J. First of all, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. I wanted to just uh, sing your praises a little bit, you know, because not only were you incredibly early to uh, the NFT scene, but you just continue to be like fearless in your leadership. Your art was always fearless. Uh, what attracted me to you and your art in the beginning was just the incredible, incredible persona in which you you occupy and you share that. Uh, and hopefully today we can begin to get into some of that and tell your story to more people. Yeah, of course. Thanks. It's definitely interesting to see how NFTs as a whole beyond just my own artwork and my own uh, creativity has expanded in the last couple of years. Um, it's definitely a completely different ecosystem now than it was when I started, but that only makes me more grateful that I started Truly. when I did <laughs> than, uh, you know, maybe if I procrastinated or, uh, now started in 2022. I'd love to just, you know, hear anything that you'd like to share about yourself and then probably first, you know, what attracted you to NFTs and, and what were you creating and sharing in the beginning? Yeah, so um, I guess I started, or I guess my story begins with uh, my education. So I studied graphic design. I have a fine art degree in design. And uh, I graduated in December of 2019. And I was attempting to freelance for a couple months. But then with COVID, it really stopped me in my track. So I was kind of just hanging out, vibing, like experimenting with different things, still learning a lot uh, because from the beginning, I knew I didn't want to stick to graphic design. It was just kind of like a little, you know, get the degree and then move on from there. And I had been involved with cryptocurrency through my education, which is how I was able to kind of finance my career without having to get a job is I just sold all my crypto uh, after investing in like 2016 ish. So, um, I cashed everything out and that's what helped me just sort of maintain my financial Liberty. And then once that ran out, uh, I started looking into different options because there were, nobody was looking to, uh, hire on new freelancers. They were mostly just working to support their own design studios. So I was just working on a bunch of different projects, going to like model castings, you know, applying to galleries really just experimenting with like how else I could participate in any, you know, adjacent creative industry. And I had seen a lot of my sort of mutual artist friends on Twitter get involved with NFTs. And it just seemed really interesting to me. So I luckily had plenty of experience dealing with crypto prior. And that really allowed me to just kind of take a lot of what I was working on during that sort of first six months of COVID lockdown and reinterpret that into like what NFTs are. And I think it was a perfect storm because I already really love to use Twitter. It's like my preferred social media at the time. And I already understood how to use crypto. And I already had a backlog of unmonetized sort of like personal projects. And so everything just sort of came together. And I believe my first mint was actually just like 3D motion graphics I remember and sort those. of animation. Yeah. So, yeah, it comes full circle because um, it still was pretty heavily rooted in my design education. And uh, after I sort of found a community of other artists and other queer artists in the space, like Sarah Zucker and Lux Pris and Frank, um, I was like, wait a minute, this is NFTs. Like this is decentralized. Like I have so much more agency. I can kind of just do whatever I want. So, uh, I started in like the late summer, early fall of 2020 and then October rolled around 
and something I had been doing also all throughout my education, which kind of parallels my journey with crypto as well, because it kind of started at the same time, was my uh, drag. So I actually, now that I think about it, it's really funny. I bought like my first set of makeup and also my first cryptocurrency like within the same week. Um, so, but I had been doing drag for like a couple of years at this point, but never quite figured out how to uh, elevate it to mm. fit into the rest of my work. And so it was always just something I would do as a sort of side hobby. Um, and especially because of lockdown, there was like really no outlet for any drag artists, no matter how, uh, you know, established you were before, or if you were just like me doing drag in your bedroom. But I realized like now October is coming around. So, you know, it's Halloween. Let's somehow bring drag into this world of NFTs because it's like, you know, it just seemed a bit like of a silly idea. And people really liked it. People really appreciated it. People thought it was kind of badass. And ever since that like initial moment, like that first couple months in the space, I really realized like, oh, this is just, I don't want to say the wild west, but that, because that's really corny, but it's like, like unchiseled marble. Like you can really take this sort of uh, monolith of new technology and uh, manipulate it to be however you see fit and however you can interpret it into your own creativity. And it felt like finally after uh, what felt like years of waiting for this opportunity through, you know, studying design and struggling through the pandemic, I had finally discovered this like brand new uh, mm. frontier of creativity that seemed to be made of a community of people that really appreciated the different styles that of uh, art that people were bringing into the space and like the whole crypto art movement and everything like really pre 2021 it just felt so raw which was very exciting and then uh, yeah since then I've just been pretty much slowly developing my single edition pieces and putting out work uh, really with an emphasis on trying to yeah. be intentional and not rushing things because I know that's a really big um, like instinct. The first instinct people have, a lot of artists have, when discovering this sort of untapped potential of blockchain, they just want to jump right in and do what like the first idea that comes to mind or maybe like all of their ideas at once. But to me, I think also this has to do with my education background. Like I love art history and I always did a bunch of research on like my favorite designers, my favorite artists. And I know that these artists and these designers have careers that last for decades. So, uh, Ever since the beginning, I've just been trying to pace myself and not burn out too quickly or figure out ways to really make sure that the work I'm putting out now, even in like the baby steps of what we're building, will still be relevant in 10, 15, 20 years. There is so much to unpack there. And I'm just going to like uh, begin <laughs> to to start. I think like we really see perhaps and I don't know how correlated you think they are, but like beginning to use cryptocurrency, the idea of like self-sovereignty, self-empowerment at the same time that you're beginning to like uh, work with makeup to do more drag, like, and then finally bringing it all back into crypto art to have kind of like a combined medium for the self-expression uh, and then to bring it like directly to people through Twitter I mean, when I saw the art and I was deep in the market, I remember it as incredibly shocking, right? I was like, this yeah. <laughs> is so new. This is so interesting. And I was vibing with it. And I even remember, like, you've always been a bit of a, and I'm just going to say it again, like a lightning rod in your fearlessness, right? Like you stand opinionated, you stand behind your art. Uh, and I remember early on in the beginning, something I was very impressed with was I think you had the video of your hands, right? Yeah. And you did like the whole reveal of how this piece was created. Um, and I only bring it up because, you know, the <laughs> I don't was it the first piece that, you know, we ended up connecting on transparency? 
<laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So maybe I I don't know what you want to talk about there, but I'd I'd love to hear just um from you like why this is you think a space for new artists and new medium and you know people always say you know where is the art in the nft space and i really believe like the art is with you and you hold such a strong opinion i would just love to hear that and and share that with people um i have to laugh at that a little bit it feels like a star wars moment like the force <laughs> is with you but yeah, I mean, um yeah I think, um, yeah, I do really remember like when I released my Genesis piece on Super Rare, like that was a really big moment, not just for me, but also I feel like for a lot of other artists in the yeah. space to see that, um, you know, some of the people, the queer artists that I mentioned that came before me, I think probably saw what I was doing and realize like oh we are building this sort of space for ourselves and i also recognize that uh when i see other new artists new queer artists come into the space in 2021 and 2022 i'm like thrilled to see the development of this of our community beyond just my own independent work but um yeah i think also it was like the first real like performance piece on super rare at the time the market was really heavily dominated by just like computer graphics, sort of 3D modeling and animation. And to see uh, somebody who just didn't really care about what the market was sort of patroning at the time and just kind of like I, my main concern was just like, like I said, you know, this is a new opportunity for myself. So I'm going to do what I feel inclined and free to finally now do. I'm not going to just make what the market is selling or the market is buying, you know? So I think that was also a, a, a nice refreshing message. I was with um, this fashion photographer last night. She was like really inspired by the Margiela did a, a winter 21, like all digital show. I don't know if you've seen it. It was incredible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I thought of after she showed it to me was that piece. And I showed it to her and we were just like, so, and it was also so cool to see like fashion come alive. Like this idea of, uh, I mean, what were we speaking about last night? Like androgyny, the future of gender, the fluidity of gender. It's such yeah. a important topic to explore. And anyways, I'll, I'll leave it there and just let you continue. Yeah, I think uh, the reason I was sort of speaking for artists in the community and how they perceived the genesis, even though like uh, in my own words, is because if you look at who bid on that piece, you have Sarah Zucker, Hackatow, Robness, Matt yeah. Kane, like a lot of these people who have really come to uh, also be strong names as artists. But um, it's also great to see that uh, at the time, you know, I was still trying to figure things out and I still am now, but it's really interesting to see how this expression of my identity which at the time for myself was like pretty straightforward just like let me show like let me really give it to them let me show them everything i can do like i just wanted to show the full like breadth of my identity and what i could do creatively and my vision and now seeing how um the topic of identity is brought up very often because people are dealing with like anonymity or, you know, gender identity or um, the identity politics in a space like the metaverse is really um, a much more interesting and deep conversation even beyond like our own personal life. And I touched on it a bit before, I said it was the first performance piece, but it was also very interesting because at the time, it the the market was really dominated by this idea mm. that we should all be anonymous and like we should all really be um i don't know like just looking at the art for the art and not pay attention to the artist and like kind of remove all personal identity biases and so this was really sort of a, a different approach at the time and um i also realized then later a couple pieces later with the hand piece you're talking about, which came out, I think like two or three months after 
that a lot of the collectors then and still now I would say don't quite have um, enough understanding of what the creative process is and can be. And so I really made it a point to try to showcase like how I bring my ideas from start to finish and how the multimedia elements of my artwork is, uh, you know, really in a, just as important as the final product, just being a video or, you know, the, the final NFT. And um, then that really plays into transparency, which is how we met or really became connected because that was a big commentary on how a lot of other artists were not doing that. And they were pretty much just trying to game the system and create what I would consider like pop art Cause, cause of the digital space. At that time, space. you know, what, what was the main talking point? It was palm trees and astronauts, right? It was people yes. taking these stock 3D, you know, models, having a uneducated collector base. Like I know nothing about process, right? So again, to see behind the scenes and also to witness firsthand like your creative intelligence to design a process. I don't know if you had like maybe a small studio at the time or if you were working from home, but I know it was just like, I don't know, your mind thinks on a different level of resourcefulness that is incredibly impressive. And to show and share that, I think is really just an inspiration for any like young, emerging, aspiring artist to know that it doesn't matter like what you have it's that creativity and to like share that and bring it forward and to take people on that journey with you like they are going to want to lift you up and through if you prove yourself to have that creative mind absolutely and that's something else i really immediately recognized about blockchain and nfts when i realized that we could leverage it for our creativity was that i was so sort of used to having to like you know send cover letters or market myself to studios and hope that somebody would give me a chance while also recognizing like it's sort of a catch-22 like if you don't have professional work or like studio grade work with big clients in your portfolio then it's hard for those studios to then want to work with you because you don't really have that experience but then at the same time how do you get that experience if you don't already have it. So it's like this really weird, like uh, vicious feedback cycle. And then when I discovered NFTs, I was like, okay, cool. Like nobody, I don't have to wait for people to give me this opportunity. Like I know I have this creativity. I know I have this potential. I don't have to wait for these studios or these clients, these big companies to then believe in me. Like I only need to believe in myself and prove to people what I can do. And nobody's going to stop me. Nobody's going to like, say like i don't know it was just it's it's hard to explain if you haven't really dealt with it but it's like if um i knew i had all this potential and so it was really frustrating to deal with the fact that i couldn't get clients because i didn't really have the uh professional experience but then um but that also really that that experience played deeply into how i viewed the collector market in nft space like i said before i know a lot of these collectors don't have formal art educations or are just within the timeline of nfts getting involved in the art space so i recognize that similar to the studios that don't really that might not um be able to recognize talent in a freelancer that hasn't necessarily like broken through yet that these collectors might not necessarily recognize talent in a piece that they don't understand so that's also a really big reason why i try to document and showcase my process to be like you know maybe you don't love the final product or it's not your taste or you know it's not your vibe but like i still think it's a lot of people can find value in just the innate process and the the labor attributed to each piece because even though I don't agree that uh, if an artwork takes a lot of time, it's intrinsically more valuable. A lot of people do think that, especially if they don't have uh, a really strong conceptual understanding of what is or isn't art. So when you show like, look, Mm -hmm. this took four months to make, and this is everything I did to get there, that might help people find more value in the art than just 
putting out the final product and hoping people get it. You know, when you came to me with transparency, I was like, what the, you know, like, I can't believe this. Like, you know, I want a Sam J piece for the museum, but I want like the, uh, like I want just one of those iconic gender bending, just like face mashing, uh, you know, Sam J pieces. And like all the best art, right? <laughs> it, I sat with it for long enough to realize, and then of course, you know what was also funny, or super funny, is you the sent me the, the infinite objects. That to me is what really makes a project actually really, really, really like one of my favorite projects I've done. Yeah, it was, it was, it's great. I love the piece. I love what it stands for. I love how it sits like with you in this process. And that's just like time stamped forever. And that's in the museum. And that's like, you and your legacy and i think it speaks to this generation of emerging artists like let's bring transparency through the blockchain through whatever it is through our yeah. processes into the world let's not behind, like hide behind the curtain anymore like let's open it up everybody can be free beautiful beautiful piece i do work both with physical and digital fashion and um sometimes i can take two months creating all the looks for a physical shoot. And then other times, depending on what I intend the concept of the project to be, like I can draft up a costume or a look for a project digitally in fractions of the time because there's no production time. It's all just natively digital. And I think um, what I was saying before, where the amount of time an artwork takes does not necessarily deem the value and that is especially prevalent in the feeling like an orchid piece because that although uh only took me maybe like two or three weeks which still might be long for some artists but for me relative to my other works is one of the sm a smaller amount of times that i've spent on it it really i feel like had one of the biggest impacts out of all the pieces i released in 2021 yeah, I mean, just a tremendous, beautiful piece. Was it your first time at Art Basel? It was mine. Yeah, it yeah. was my first um, time. What an interesting <laughs> experience that was. I mean, I think you, you know, you show up with such, again, like a, a big and powerful piece. I am always, I, it's, it's so interesting to me that in the moment i cannot like i cannot see the power of the art but in retrospect like what a beautiful piece to bring to that it's just a tremendous artwork um maybe we can talk a bit about you know this and and this is obviously core to kind of what we're doing between the museum and a minty this dialogue that we're trying to begin to have with uh the existing contemporary art worlds and this new form of crypto art um so how was perhaps like basel for you i thought it was very interesting to experience the traditional art world really for the first time like so in person because something I definitely recognize as one of my biggest shortcomings is that, like I said, I really graduated art school and then pretty much straight jumped into NFTs. So my entire experience as an artist is only through like digital media and uh, like the metaverse and Web3. So really seeing like how artwork is displayed, can be displayed, how different brands are getting involved and the sort of nuances of the traditional art market in like its peak commodification, uh, for better or for worse, was definitely really interesting and helped inform my decisions moving forward as an artist being like, okay, this is what I like, this is what I didn't like. Um, I was, uh, I appreciated that because all of my work is digital, I was able to have, I think like a total of five showings right. <laughs> just because you know it'd be halfway through the weekend and people would be like oh we're throwing this event like can we just put your shit up on a display and be like yeah why not like it's cool but definitely 
that was also a big learning experience because again, moving forward, I want to be far more intentional with mm. how I display my work because even though everything is just a matter of like putting a file on a di digital display, whether a projection or a TV or whatever, um, I think there still should be a lot more intention behind it. And um, there should, uh, I intend to be more selective on how I display my works, where I display my works and who gets to display more? I uh, am going to just echo that sentiment. Like I went to the main fair, right? Which uh, I thought NFTs on TV screens looked like crap compared to the physical artwork that was there. Um, it's for me, it's almost like metaverse or bust, right? I want to see that like 3D sculpture of you 30 feet tall in the metaverse, right. right? And I want to be able to like fly up and around and see the detail and see the styling of that. I, you know, it's interesting to put it into AR on a phone and like take a picture with it. But at that point, it feels almost gimmicky. I'm, I'm so much more interested in the experiential of that. And right. I think when we reduce art to television screens it takes on the same importance and value as television <laughs> yes i completely agree i think a great analogy is like recently i saw dune in imax 3d yeah and i went back to see it again and just regular and it was like regular 2d even in a cinema it was like way underwhelming and i kind of felt bad and that's really the thing like uh, I know Christopher, like a lot of people talk about like Christopher Nolan and, you know, he uses too many, you know, bass music tracks and like people can't hear the audio. But it's like if you watch Inception or Tenet on, an, you know, iMac versus in in theaters, you're going to get a completely different experience. And I think that's yeah. very true with NFTs. And uh, at least the last couple of months into 2022, I have really been developing physical displays for my nft projects from last year and also building new projects to go into the following year with again the same intention of like bridging both how it's displayed physically to how it's mm -hmm. displayed digitally as an nft and making both equally relevant um something i really learned while in school for graphic design is like how like if you're designing a book cover, you need to be aware that like when you're looking at the cover of a book versus when it's, you know, in between two books on a bookshelf, mm -hmm. you can't see that cover anymore. So the spine needs to be just as identifiable as the front. And that I think I was watching this video about architecture and somebody said, when you're designing a doorknob, think about how it's going to fit onto the door. And like, that's really how I think about my work, even as NFTs. Like if I'm designing a piece to be natively digital, I really like to play with scale. I like to play with like floating objects because then gravity is not a thing, especially with digital fashion. Like that's really a big element, especially for the piece that I had in Art Basel. I'm floating. I have like all these things around me. This gown is impossibly large that I'm wearing. It's like so... I'm really my design for this, the dress and the composition of this piece was specifically to be viewed digitally and only digitally because of these things. And I was really embracing a lot of uh, what limits us in physic in like physicality and uh, going beyond that. But conversely, like with transparency, that is extremely underwhelming. And then it's kind of tongue in cheek. There's a lot more context to it. It really makes a lot more sense. That's really how I try to create most of my projects is really with an understanding of like what the final product is going to be and really embracing that element of either, you know, duality between the physical world and the digital world, or if it's natively digital or, you know, all of these things like the project I'm working on right now will have a physical and a digital, but they will be like completely separate, even though it's all one NFT and like really playing with the idea of, you know, sort of forking a physical object. And I don't know, it's, I, I think it's really important. I don't think very many people put enough thought into it, including people curating the galleries and putting these NFTs on display. 
but that's why I, again, am like not really letting people, or I'm really trying to hold people's hand by like showing them the process, doing it kind of for them, like leading by example, creating displays for pieces that are months mm -hmm. old even just to really show curators that hope to display my work in the future. Like this is the standard right. that I'm setting for myself. So this is a standard that I hope to hold the people who are curating and my artwork and gentlemen, well. I've seen previews of this upcoming piece. It's, it's <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited for everybody else to see it. Um, something that's incredibly interesting to me and I think probably interesting to you as well is, you know, I just saw uh, Tom Ford had to cancel their February show because of, you know, COVID and delays in the factory and, and not being able to get like materials from Italy. Um, you know, we see different fashion DAOs popping up for Metaverse. We see uh, entrances of, of major fashion brands into this space. Uh, first off, has there been anything that has impressed you in that regard? No. <laughs> yeah. I think okay. right now <laughs> digital fashion is um, a bit there's not enough use case for it. So right. I, my experience, I've done pieces in VR and AR. And I remember before I got involved with NFTs, I tried to make an AR magazine mm -hmm. where it was like, actually like a 50 page magazine as a 3D model that you could flip through. But the technology just wasn't there yet. Like I had everything animated where like the only technology I needed was some way to make an AR model accessible to phones that also had the use case where you tap once and one page flips and you tap the other side and it flips backwards. But that wasn't a thing. Now AR has jumped quite a bit forward. I'm, I know right. Snap Lenses, like Lens Studio is really, really good, but it's still like, there's a difference between a, a Snap Lens and an actual metaverse where I would want mm -hmm. to own cosmetics. I mean, I, I grew up playing Counter-Strike and I understand like the, skin the gun. you know, whole yeah. uh, skins and like Fortnite skins and all of that. And I do think that there, that's very much like a seedling of it, but I don't think that like they weren't NFTs before and I don't really think they need to be NFTs going into the future. So I'm not exactly sure how right. like couturiers or anything like that is going to develop into the metaverse because um, at least from my work, I choose to contextualize fashion within the realm mm -hmm. of fine art and not within the realm of like mm -hmm. ready to wear. So I don't think there's a use case for a lot of these brands, which have been really um, sort of, sharpening in onto like how they can most commodify their like creative direction through ready to wear. Right. And um, that it, that's not, there's not a use case to then migrate that same business model into the metaverse yet, because you don't really need to like, you don't really need to. So there's, it's, it's like, there's going to four at this, at this point, be, it's, it's yeah yeah i think i think um it's yeah. kind of just a waiting game to see what kind of metaverse develops and then i think a lot of these major fashion houses are n not going to make it in the metaverse and we're going to see new fresh designers or fashion DAOs who will really truly understand the new metaverses that are being built and uh than you know creating in that way i think maybe artifact actually is the best um yeah. showcase because they just started out kind of doing sneakers and having fun and like making a making something that really was um popular in the market and they were really smart about it and nike recognized them and i think that's probably what we're going to see moving forward is these web three native studios and houses yep. maybe popping up and then maybe, you know, Gucci will buy it or Kerning yep. group or, or LVMH. But I don't think we're going to see like Louis Vuitton 
really blowing up. Actually, maybe because Louis Vuitton has had some digital fashion prior, like in like League of Legends yeah. and Final Fantasy and stuff. But I do. I mean, it's, you know what I mean? <laughs> I, I think we probably want to like begin to draw a line from perhaps like the high to the low. Right. And I think the fashion houses sit kind of atop like the the streetwear and the hype beast culture um and then you know art probably exists in parallel to like the the high fashion uh and then you know i want to kind of get into this idea of collectibles with you because i think right. what happened after the beeple sale was everybody really you know began to associate an nft with art and not only that they associated it with expensive art so there was and the way the media was portraying it i think was very disingenuous um in that it was like mint and nft make money and i and i applaud you and i think this is a uh, a wonderful part of your practice is that one you never rushed right you never rush you always put out that like finished project that you were happy about and it was always one at a time very hyper diligent um so how has it been as an artist you know working at this high end of the market to begin to see this influx of people come in trading flipping is it um is it just noise that you try and drown out is it something that uh you know bothers you will you ever you know look to perhaps like create more additions and bring your work to more people uh i'm curious how how you know these developments have uh reflected back into you and your practice yeah i think i'm really lucky just kind of how things happened because from the beginning i always knew i wanted to have this really highbrow element to my work um and even before i was on super rare when i was just putting out random projects and figuring out my work in 2020 I was still putting out only single editions for the most part. And I recognized, especially once I started doing drag and performance art and work with like, I don't know, that was really on the fringes of even crypto art itself. Like I knew I was sort of fighting an uphill battle to make people see this as like true highbrow, uh, relevant cultural art at the same level that you would see maybe like a, a fine art painting. Because not only is it um, really nothing that's been done before, like ever in any industry, but it's also um, really far removed from what a lot of the collectors in the crypto market understand as art. I always say like, you know, everybody can look at a painting and understand that it's artwork. But if you look at like a video of my performance, you might be like, what, yeah. what the fuck is this? Like you don't intrinsically understand that it's art unless you really have spent time to like understand who I am as an artist or you followed me for a long time or you have a lot of education and experience in the art industry prior to looking into my work. So with all of these things that I, I understood all of these elements sort of that were fighting against me. I always thought like, I really need to be intentional and I don't want anybody to, I don't want to give anybody like an inch to then say like, oh, this isn't art. This is just collectible. This is just, you know, right. a cash grab or whatever. And so as things kept unfolding, I just sort of then already had this reputation I was building for myself even before I was selling for a lot of money. Like I really had this reputation in the community also this expectation for myself um i would always finish a project and then wait for like a week or two just looking at it and just not post it anywhere and just look and be like hmm is this like is there anything wrong is there anything i want to fix is there any 
glitches because also when you're working with so many different moving pieces on like a 60 second video there might just be an error so i, I rewatch it like dozens of times um kind of like how people treat a tattoo like if you talk to a tattoo artist they're like just look at the design for like a month before you get it and if you still like it after a month then you can get a tattoo and that's how i treated my artwork because it really um to me like the permanence of the blockchain is sort of relevant to mm. the permanence of a tattoo so i figure like every artwork i'm putting out is going to be relevant to every artwork mm. in the future everything is building on top of itself so in terms of how the market then sort of diverged into collectibles and everything like it was just so far removed from what i was doing that it hasn't really affected me or my mindset at all luckily and even before collectibles there was still a lot of speculative markets within the art totally. space and that was something i was very actively trying to subvert which i think at this point has now really paid off um because um at the time like i was asking people i wasn't tweeting about how much my art was selling for i would just tweet like it sold and then if you really wanted to know how much you could go check but like i wasn't going to try to feed into the sort of pump and dump of like oh my art keeps going up so buy it now uh that's a very bad narrative i think especially as a yeah. artist starting out and i was i asked myself to be removed from like the super rare bot mm. that automatically tweets sales and stuff so i was really like fighting against that narrative um now so not anymore i don't think because people aren't really uh the speculative market has really moved beyond art so i feel a bit more comfortable um tweeting about my sales and all of that and uh but in terms of yeah the, i think that's good yeah i i, I don't know yeah, it's definitely something I, I'm glad I did. I don't, I feel like that's a very anticlimactic answer though, because I'm kind of just like, oh, like collectibles it's are collectibles. The right answer. I, I did a whole, you know, it's just almost like a, yeah. a period. So I, I want to tell one more story. Um, and, you know, I was, uh, I tweeted something stupid. I forget what I tweeted. It was, it was something probably like, you know, artists, tell people to pay you ETH, right? Yeah. And uh, I was out at dinner and I get a FaceTime from Sam. And uh, before I know it, he had hung up. I, I FaceTime him back. He's like, don't worry about it. And, you know, this is, this is it's just um, amazing because I think at the same time that you are so intentional, you're also so creative in the moment and you're not afraid to like create and put that piece out there when it is of its time. Um, because like three hours later, there was a 3D object uh, up on Super Rare that like people can go and, and see. And um, yeah, I, I loved that. That was super, super cool work. Uh, and we'll leave it as a cliffhanger for people to go kind of check that out. Um, but like, please send us home, tell people where to find you, shout out your collectors, where can they find your art, uh, anything you want to say to send us home. Um, yeah, thank you for having me. I always appreciate the opportunity. Um, and you can find me at Sam J Studios on Instagram and Twitter, samjstudios.com. Uh, yeah, most of my work is going to be on Super Rare. To any artists watching, just try to be intentional and sort of set a mission statement for yourself that you can stay true to throughout all of the uh, chaos that is the space and just ground yourself in your work and the intentions you set for yourself. I love it. Yeah. I'm and Cole Bell with artist Sam J. This is NFT Sundays, uh, Museum of Crypto Art and Deminty. Breaking news. Breaking news.